Merry Christmas, church. I want to welcome one and all. Thank you for joining us for making this uh, retelling of the great and timeless story a part of your Christmas celebration. And uh, it is a sacred privilege that we have. And the kids are going to help us tell it tonight. In fact, they're going to be doing the telling. I'm going to see this for the first time tonight. I haven't even seen them practicing yet. So we're together we're going to enjoy now, I want to tell you that at the time uh, when they're doing their program and it mentions the hymns, you're to sing along. This is an interactive celebration. And so I will remind you of that tonight. We celebrate tonight the incarnation of our God. The good news of Jesus Christ, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. With that, I ask you and invite you to join me in prayer. Glorious God, thank you. Thank you for your extreme and glorious love for each one of us, your special creation. Tonight, as we tell and retell that story, thank you for that sacred privilege. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. We pray your blessing on this gathering and on each heart as we gather to receive the light of the world. Amen. Oh. And with that, I invite you to pray together the prayer found in your bulletin. God of love, we welcome this blaze of light at the dawning of Christmas. You may be seated.
In Bethlehem town, a long time ago, a baby was born, God's ought to show. The shepherds all worship, the angels did sing, for with the birth of Jesus the King. The birthday of a king? Doesn't that sound wonderful? What are you talking about? A king, you know, fanfares, crown jewels, royal palaces. It wasn't like that at all. As a matter of fact, this birth was anything but glamorous. No chariots? Not exactly. Emperor Augustus had ordered a census. Joseph had to go from Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem in Judea because it was the birthplace of King David, and Joseph was one of his descendants. It was a long trek. But they must have had a chariot. Nothing like it, in fact. We're not sure if Mary, Joseph's wife, walked or rode a donkey, but she was pregnant and probably exhausted. When they finally arrived in Bethlehem, the time had come for Mary to have her baby. Uh-oh, no hospitals, I take it? Maybe I'll stop complaining about some of my less than stellar birthdays. Good idea. But even in the midst of all that dust and mud, and walking for what must have seemed like forever, amazing things were happening. It started outside the city limits, where shepherds were watching over their flocks by night. But Mary and Joseph's only thoughts were on finding a place to stay. That was a problem. The town, was, the town of Bethlehem did have an inn, but when Joseph tried to get a room, there weren't any. The inn was full. But a strange thing happened. The innkeeper just couldn't turn his back on a couple from Galilee. He had already turned a dozen people away that day, and it didn't bother him. But something about this couple did. What should I do? My workers are up to their elbows and doing their stuff. And I have plenty of work to do myself. And Mary, she looks so exhausted and she's ready to have the baby. In the way her husband stares at her, his eyes pleading, but it's more than that. It's like they have a secret that no one else in the world knows. It's like something monument monumental is about to happen, something that would change the world forever. Maybe the woman and her husband are more than what meets the eye. I can't quite put my finger on it. There's just something about them. That's ridiculous. The man is just a simple car from Nazareth in Galilee. And you know, they say nothing good comes from that town. So why do I feel so certain this is no ordinary birth and no ordinary occasion? <laughs> I can't stop thinking about the man's eyes either. I thought he wanted us to understand something that was not our liberty to explain. Something in his heart seemed all torn apart. Yet it was drawn through with messages so new. It came from God
emergency to do something. They need a shelter, a roof over their heads, and a place to sleep protected from the chill night air. But I can't turn people out to give them a room. Don't be the a stable. Why didn't I think of it sooner? If I only can catch him. Joseph. So this king wasn't born in a palace? That's right. But if this baby is really a king, wouldn't people have known what was going on? Shouldn't trumpets have been blowing or a royal announcement made? God did announce the birth with a star. A star? A star so bright, no one knew what to make of it. People all over the world saw it. Some recognized it as a message from God, but others had no idea what it meant. Why, it's a star. It's so bright it woke us up. I thought it was morning and the sun was shining in my eyes. But you're not a little star. You're the biggest, brightest star I've ever saw. other stars out tonight, but they're smaller. It's like all the little stars want to sing to the big stars. shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of God shone around them, and they were terrified. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men.
back in Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph had no idea about this. All they knew was that the innkeeper had a sudden change of heart. Let me guess, he did give them the best room in the whole place. Not quite. He did feel bad for them, Mary being pregnant and all, but he wasn't about to kick somebody out of the inn. He told them that they could stay in the barn. You're kidding. Unfortunately, no. Mary had been visited by an angel who told her she was going to give birth to a savior. At this point, she probably thought she had hallucinated. We're talking sharing your bed with a cow? And a mule, a couple of sheep, and maybe even some squawking chickens. What a mess. Yes and no. Mary had been through a lot already. She was very tired, but it's likely that she felt peace. A peace that passes all understanding when you know God is in control. A king, born in a stable, sleeping in a manger, and wearing rags. Anybody who found him in the manger might have considered him a pauper. I think God made sure that that didn't happen. That's why he sent the angels in the star. I think he wanted the people to know that the king was real, but different. The prophets of old had predicted this night for thousands of years. Some people were wise to it. Three wise men from the east had seen the star and followed it. Wings of glory and 
house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They offered gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, I think I see the meaning of all this. Born in a stable, a manger for a bed, everything about this baby was as humble as it could be. I think it meant that he was going to be a truly different kind of king. And I think that's what the Christmas story is all about. This night, so tiring, so painful, so historic, and so unforgettable, shows us what royalty really is. Jesus would grow up and say, he who is last will be first. He who is first will be last. He proved it to us this night. What more can we say? You're doing a great job, everyone. Thank you. Um, maybe let me sum this up, if I may. It was over 2,000 years ago that God made this amazing appearance on earth as a helpless baby. He became Emmanuel, God with us, fully human, yet fully God. He became like us in every way, except he was supernaturally born in the most natural way. Jesus assumed physical humanity like you and me, dealing with all of life's joys and suffering the harsh realities of being a human being. Through it all, he set aside his divine nature for some 30 years, still being and doing only that which was holy, which was righteous, which was good, bringing glory to his Father. He did not succumb to human nature's temptations to sin, but remained pure, holy, and spotless his entire life so that he might become the sinless, spotless, sacrificial Lamb of God in our stead. So apart from the early announcements by angels, the visit of foreign magi and our other prophetic voices that spoke to his destiny in those early years, Jesus must have lived a somewhat ordinary life. Jesus took his place as the firstborn in Mary and Joseph's family. He took his place in that Jewish society and worshiping community. He honored his father and mother, and might I say was the best big brother that siblings could ever have. He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Jesus' devotion to his heavenly Father never wavered. He grew up with a destiny to bring about the kingdom of God and our salvation. For decades, he lived an ordinary life as a carpenter's son. But in his 30s, Jesus' public ministry began. He gathered and he taught his disciples. He preached the kingdom of God manifest in the world through him. His ministry came with authority and power and with love. Lives were changed. Hearts were changed. God was glorified. Jesus manifest marvelous signs and wonders. And he claimed oneness with God. Some believed, others scorned and hated him for what he claimed. Until finally everything came to a head. The purpose of Jesus' birth decades earlier had finally arrived. Jesus was rejected, tortured, and crucified for his claims of deity. The evil of humanity, the wicked sinfulness of the world, was heaped on him as a scapegoat. The Lamb of God came to take away the sins of the world. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus died a criminal's death, but was raised in God's victorious power. Through faith in the Son of God, with repentance and forgiveness, we can become reconciled, righteous children of God, with the Spirit of God abiding in us and making us alive in Him. The life we now live, we live victoriously by faith in the Son of God. As children of the one true God, we proclaim the gospel of peace, the kingdom of God, and our destiny of bringing praise, glory, and honor to God is fulfilled. As Jesus taught us, we proclaim this good news, this gospel to the world. Jesus' birth is a story of God's love for the world. And we have been entrusted with that to tell the world that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. My prayer is that Christ would be born in all of our hearts at the retelling of the ageless story of God's love for you and for me. May we, his precious loved ones, may we hear his voice and welcome him in our hearts as king. Revelation 11:15 says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. All the armies, armies that, that ever, ever marched, marched, all, all the navies that, that ever sailed, all, all the, the governments, governments that, that ever sacked, all the kings that ever reigned, have not affected the course of history as much as King Jesus. Let us sing together, Hark the Herald, number 240. Oh, I'm sorry. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Um, he will reign on David's throne over his kingdom with, it with justice and righteousness. It's from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. I just want to tell you how blessed we are that you were willing and able and, and conveyed so wonderfully the story of Christ's birth. Aren't we appreciative? <laughs> and I also want to express, express my appreciation to our teachers and for our leaders and for Abby and for Karen and their special part in putting this all together. Thank them. With that, please stand as we sing together, Hark the Herald.
I invite you to be seated as now we recognize that Jesus is the light of the world and we pass that love to one another. Merry Christmas, everyone. Go and share the light of Christ with the world. Amen.